Um, the next speaker for today is uh, Nikolai Boyajiev. He's an architect, strategist, and educator working between Montreal and Moscow. He is currently a faculty in the program Design and Education Tutor at Strelka Institute in Moscow. He lectures regularly at various institutions around Europe and North America, and he is a visitor, visiting academic faculty at IAAC in Barcelona, Masters of City and Technology, and KADK in Copenhagen. Masters in Urbanism and Societal Change. Nikolai has joined us uh, today in presence and we want to thank you so much for coming. Now, um, please come to the, to the stage. Thanks. Can you hear me? So uh, thank you, thank you for joining uh, IRL and thank you to the organizers actually for inviting me uh, to join uh, uh, IRL. Uh, this is my first uh, kind of IRL uh, presentation since, since March, so, so you're warned. Uh, also thank you for, for the topic uh, of, um, of this, uh, of this uh, event. Uh, actually uh, we spend a lot of time at Stroka and I spend a lot of time talking and thinking about the content of, of our work uh, and uh, it's actually pretty rare to have the time and the privilege to step back and think about the process around uh, education uh, practice. So this was actually a very nice uh, opportunity for us to, for me to reflect on the kind of work that I've been doing for the past, uh, for the past four years. Uh, it's also nice actually that I'm, that I'm speaking right after Ella because I think we're going to be uh, talking about very similar things. Uh, although probably from very different uh, perspectives. I, I think that uh, Ella's work, obviously, in, even in the way that she was talking about it, was very much centered on the, on the sort of the user and the, from the human experience level. Uh, being a, an architect, uh, I'm, pro I'm probably going to talk a bit more from the kind of system uh, direction. And, and if, if, if you know uh, architects, we, we, tend to, we tend to do that uh, for, for, better, for, for better or worse. So, uh, as, as mentioned, uh, I'm, uh, I'm a designer and architect, uh, kind of working in between uh, these two uh, very different uh, places. Uh, I uh, currently kind of uh, co-lead and teach at the Terraforming uh, Design Research Think Tank at, at, at Stroka, uh, which is uh, an institute in, uh, in Moscow. I just wonder, before I, I, I start, uh, do, has anyone ever heard of Stroka, or people are kind of new to the... Okay, so, uh, just so I don't repeat anything that you guys already know. Uh, it was kind of basically founded uh, about 10 years ago, and, uh, and uh, I've been uh, with the Institute basically in uh, different capacities. I was a student slash, re slash uh, researcher in 2015-16 during the hybrid, hybrid urbanism uh, research phase of the, of the program, kind of trying to bridge the physical with the virtual. Then uh, I was a program design education tutor at the New Normal, which I'll talk about uh, at, in, in length, uh, and uh, currently as well at the Terraform. Um, like... Um, like Ella also kind of start, started, I think it's really actually important to talk, like if you're going to talk about education in 2020, you have to kind of talk about 2020. Uh, it's not uh, to kind of give a, a in-depth expose of, or like a cultural critique or, or analysis of everything that is happening and has happened in 2020, but I think it's important to kind of situate the, the um, you know, the, the, the context of, of, of this work and also possibly what is Probably we think it's a crazy year, but I actually th think that it's likely the most normal year that we're going to have in the next 10 years. And therefore, the conversation around education has to somehow, um, uh, especially design education, uh, take, like, l learn from the takeaways of, 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 this, of, this, uh, of this crisis, so-called, that we've been uh, going through. So just to begin with, I'd like to just situate what I think are the three main components that we've been integrating as well within our work for the terraforming, and then uh, to explain a little bit better uh, uh, how we sort of accommodate education structures to deal with these, two, these takeaways. I think the first kind of important point uh, for, for, for everyone, but especially for designers, is what we kind of call at Straka the revenge of the real. This is a moment of the revenge of the real. Uh, it's not, as many people possibly have seen or chosen to speak about this, a state of exception. It's not a black swan event that somehow is uh, out, of the, um, out of any possible um, planning, but it really is a, is a very drastic reminder of the infrastructures that, 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 that contain us. So infrastructures being obviously um, you know, the, the, the physical infrastructures that actually allowed us to continue to kind of exist in a 
sort of normal or new normal way during that time, but also the, the kind of um, you know, biological infrastructures that we are also part of. The, the fact that we kind of coexist with viruses and the city is a place where, where, um, where it's not simply some place where we are inside of, but it's actually something that, uh, that it, it takes into account various different things, is really a, 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 a moment for us to kind of wake up from various fictions, various fictions that we have been entertaining uh, and various, I think, cultural fictions that are, that are uh, informing how we think about design. Uh, so whether it's in the case of the, of, the, of the crisis, where you kind of see the people's beliefs uh, in sharp, kind of, I think, nicely summarizing uh, the, the kind of different takes that I've seen uh, during the pandemic, but also in terms of climate change, uh, the, the, the fictions that we sort of live in, as in we are somehow separate from the biological matter of the world, which obviously uh, we use, but it also uses us, like the virus, is something of, of a moment of the puncturing of these narratives, uh, and obviously the very traumatic processes that are uh, kind of related to that reawakening. The reawakening of, of, of reality sort of produces a traumatic event, whether you choose to accept it or deny it, and we've definitely seen uh, cases, uh, cases of both. I think a second uh, takeaway that is really important uh, is the, what we call the, the return of the social or sometimes, as we've spoken about it in our think tank, uh, the epidemiological view of society. So when I think about the, the social, I don't just mean like obviously the, the incredible infrastructures of, of, of support and care and, and people taking care of one another during this difficult time, uh, but really this kind of, you know, the, 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 the crash course of our shared interdependence, the, 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 the crash course in our, in our uh, un, ability to understand ourselves as individuals being part of a larger statistical whole. Uh, probably the most iconic image, you know, we all know the iconic images of other crises, whether it's 9-11 or other, other crises. Uh, probably the most iconic image, I think, of, uh, in, in, in our opinion, is, is, this, uh, is the flattening the curve um, sort of diagram, which is obviously an image. And this kind of allows us to understand sort of intuitively understand ourselves as part of something larger. So when I mean uh, the return to social, again, not just in terms of uh, society and culture, but also us, our biological and chemical codependency to one another. Again, a very important thing to keep in mind of and sort of reawake to uh, as it kind of gets, uh, you know, um, kind of buried across other fictions that are obviously much more detrimental and much more false, I think. Uh, luckily, of course, uh, this year, uh, best, best headline ever, uh, there, Boris Johnson uh, admits that there is such a thing as society from, from his bunker. Uh, so essentially, this is the, the, the kind of social that I am also interested in kind of talking about today. And at Stralka, we choose to talk about not simply the kind of, um, let's say, uh, cultural layer that kind of unites us as humans, but I think moreover the, the, um, the chemical interdependencies that essentially we need to be dealing with in this next uh, decade uh, slash uh, century. And finally, I think uh, something important uh, and uh, I think obvious <laughs> is the, what we call the, the, the speculative becoming real time. By that I mean is um, essentially uh, we, I mean as, as an architect and designer and, and teaching across the board, you often see this kind of uh, impulse uh, to um, sort of creatively imagine a different world, uh, to have some sort of speculative design uh, projection where you sort of park your craziest ideas to kind of problematize and, and, and question uh, the future. I think what we've seen in the past uh, few months is really, and what we've seen at Stroka, that kind of our most speculative design projects that you know a few months ago ended up being way less interesting and actually way less speculative than the reality and, uh, and the, the fact that all these projects are collapsing into real-time initiatives as quickly as they can is I think something that's quite uh, I think quite important for design education. Uh, I mean there's obviously many uh, we've seen a lot of kind of there's listicles and listicles of, of these kind of uh, photos of like you know, things that uh, are in sharp contrast, uh, you know, from the, from the sex doll uh, football audience to the remote baptisms and so on. Uh, 
There's actually a lot of lists uh, also floating around. Uh, I mean, this is one of them, the new possible. But there's 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 many that are sort of uh, tracking uh, tracking lists of things that were completely impossible, but now actually <laughs> they totally weren't because they're happening <laughs> all all across the board. Whether it's UBI, uh, universal basic income, you know, people being paid to stay at home. Uh, whether it's um, I mean, there's a whole range of things that, again, rents being canceled and so on, things that people have been arguing for years that everyone was agreeing, no, the economy can't change, no, culture can't change, no, social expectations can't change. <laughs> Obviously, that is very much not the case. And uh, if, if, you, if you're familiar with the concept of the overture window, which is basically things that are sort of acceptable in society at any given point, this, these past kind of months have really shown this kind of widening, the widening of, this, of this window which, um, which obviously is one one of the things that uh, is is uh, something that designers have always tried to 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 accomplish. The other the other point about that, and this is the last point I'm going to make before I jump into the actual presentation, is that within design uh, culture, within design education, uh, especially in the kind of more uh, elite schools that think that you know, real world, like buildings are below, like they're interesting in kind of big, big scale ideas. Uh, there is a kind of tendency of going after these uh, interesting utopian, dystopian, sci-fi, science fiction parables. And really, I think the last uh, months, um, this is something that has been our position actually at Soccer from the beginning. Um, the the, the post-interesting, which is just a nicer word for boring, the, 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 the post-interesting is actually more interesting than the interesting. The, the, the boring things that we, that designers usually think are, you know, they're not f flashy, like accounting, like infrastructure, like uh, power grids, like, uh, you know, um, energy software. These are the things that are actually more interesting uh, than the interesting. And therefore, uh, in the past few months also, we've kind of seen that possibly, hopefully, uh, I think uh, maybe a, a shift away in design schools or Again, this is more of a, of a, of a wish than a, than a, than a forecast. Uh, possibly shifting away from utopia, dystopia. Possibly shifting away from speculative reimaginings of society from the top down, and dealing with the more material reality of things, uh, which is really, again, more interesting than these so-called interesting uh, fictions. <clears throat> so, with that being said, uh, these takeaways are trying to essentially, um, we are trying uh, at Strelka to, to, um, to bleed into, into our work. And we're not alone, actually. This is not, uh, I, I wouldn't, I'm not here to sort of uh, argue for, like, that anyone has the answer, especially not us. But it's something that people are actually taking notice. And, and I don't know if you've seen this uh, recently, that uh, there's this kind of uh, desire that, or a realization, obviously, that the schools are definitely out of touch uh, and need to be kind of rethought. And therefore, there is a need for a new European Bauhaus to kind of m move to, to, to something different, which I think is actually really an interesting, uh, an interesting prompt uh, for, for me. I, I don't know if I would actually use the, the Bauhaus as the template for the, for the 21st century, but there is something interesting about this design education back then that actually had to you know, radically take a look at the new materials that were offered to their kind of design pa palette. The, new, the response to the new industries that were kind of emerging, and obviously the kind of uh, not just responding, but actually actively trying to, to you know, influence culture. And the question basically remains, is like essentially today, and in this kind of critical time, uh, what would be the, you know, what would be these, these points? I mean, obviously new materials, uh, a lot of our, our sort of design psyche is, is kind of inherited from ideals that kind of predate the discovery of most mo molecules <laughs> that we actually have found uh, in, in, the, in the past, uh, in the early 20th century. New industries such as, um, you know, uh, biotech, such as, uh, you know, what is still called, uh, for lack of a better word, AI, uh, which is actually a range of different pattern recognition technologies. Uh, and obviously, uh, the, the culture uh, that uh, the cultural shifts that I was kind of describing uh, above, these are essentially the things that we need to be engaging with as as designers and and uh, and um, educators. Uh, whereas I think the difference is actually less and less obvious who's an educator and, and who's a designer, and that's how it should be. So all this to say, basically, that uh, the the role I think 
the role of design education, but really design in the 21st century is at least as much to undo the, the inheritances, systemic, ideological, uh, methodological of the 20th century than it is to actually to, to, to add new ones. And with that in mind, I, I'd like to talk a little bit about the work that we've been doing uh, on, on that uh, at, uh, at Stroka. So, essentially, uh, if you don't know about Stroka, it's this, uh, I mean, very uh, well, um, I think, uh, showcased in social media um, compared to what it actually is. It's actually, it looks quite uh, boastful and, and, uh, and crazy for on online. Uh, it's actually quite a small, uh, essentially, it's three rooms, a bar and a courtyard uh, in, in, in Moscow. But uh, it's actually quite uh, unique in terms of its, uh, in its institutional kind of uh, framework. It's not a school, like there's no grades, there's no exams, there's no um, diplomas. It's not, a, it's not an incubator, we're, like, we're not trying to make apps or, or, or products to, to launch. And it's certainly not an art uh, residency, uh, although maybe it's a version of a, of a design residency that is maybe uh, something more urgently needed, I think, than art residencies. Uh, shorthand, it, it's an uh, institute for media, architecture, and design. Uh, originally, the name was supposed to be MAD Institute. I'm actually uh, quite happy that they chose something more uh, subtle. <laughs> but uh, it, it's trying to engage with these three things, uh, which are all essentially uh, tools uh, and, and, and um, disciplines that ought to be more connected than there actually are. Uh, it's uh, kind of uh, aggressively interdisciplinary and, uh, and collaborative. Of course, everyone, um, I've actually never heard anyone say our school is not interdisciplinary and, and collaborative. But what I mean by that is that uh, we try to take that idea kind of uh, seriously, like at, at face value. This kind of notion that uh, five people sit around a table and collaborate and they do something good. Uh, is, a f uh, I mean, at least in my experience, I'm sure in yours, also not a given. Uh, it's actually quite difficult to, for people from dis different disciplines to collaborate, find common languages to actually speak about the same thing, and uh, make sure that their outcome is not the lowest common denominator of what they actually could agree on, but actually the highest possible potential of their shared skill sets. So we try to actually, uh, beyond the kind of um, the, 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 the projects and, and, and products and, and ideas that we generate, the process of actually prototyping what a school for interdisciplinary collaboration could look like is, I think, kind of the meta project behind it all. Certainly how I see it. Uh, it's also quite uh, intensive and, and, uh, and uh, cyclical. So intensive in a sense, um, it's only five months, the whole uh, program. It's six to seven days a week. Uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say 24 hours a day, but it, it is a very kind of energy, uh, intellectual labor demanding program. Uh, by design, essentially, we're trying to say that instead of having a class every week for two years or doing a master's, which is probably, at, at least from my perspective as an architect, one of the most <laughs> psychologically draining and, uh, and, uh, and useless uh, endeavors to, to do, like working by yourself for two years on a project on your site that you've chosen, all of this is actually possibly outdated. So the intensity of the program of essentially very short, iterative, two-day, three-day workshops with different people with different, in different teams, and then we move on to the next, essentially tries to, to remove this kind of authorship, inherited uh, um, obsession that designers seem to have, like their ethics have to be sort of embedded into every single thing they do. Design is like sweating. It's like something that essentially you do in an iterative, iterative process. Some projects are good, some projects are bad. And this iteration also allows us to change the program very, very quickly. Uh, essentially, if uh, faculty didn't work out, we don't invite them back next, next cycle. If, if, um, if something works, obviously, we adapt it the, the following week. Uh, and also, uh, it allows us to, to not have any full-time uh, faculty. Essentially, it exists as a kind of uh, cu curated, uh, curated by us thematic focus for the cycle. And then we pick the people that we think would be the best, uh, both from academia and not academia, which also kind of allows people who are not uh, professional uh, advice givers to come in and give advice. And finally, obviously, uh, I completely agree with the question uh, from, from Senya earlier and also Ella's uh, response. There's almost like a, what I would call, yeah, what I, like, maybe it's recorded, like a, a criminal level of depth 
that is being kind of pursued by, by, by some schools uh, uh, in terms of like making sure that people who can afford to have an, a good design education have to kind of <laughs> indebt themselves for years after that. So our program is free. Not only is it free, but we actually offer a small stipend. So students actually get paid uh, to attend. Um, it's, it's not a lot, actually. It's about 1,000 euros a month, depending on the year and the, and the sort of rate of the ruble. Uh, but it's enough to basically uh, show our commitment to the to the to the students that as essentially we expect a kind of for them to be able to afford an apartment and afford not doing any other work on the side during these five months because essentially we are we have invited them to kind of partake in this as as uh, as um, you know full time thinkers uh, because it's free also obviously we have a lot of applicants uh, around 300 to 400 a year and we choose about 30 people which means also the the, the people who can who want to be part and can be part uh, are also usually uh, selected uh, by merit, not by whoever uh, can afford to, 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 pay, uh, to pay GSD fees. <clears throat> so also another important point, I think, is uh, the fact that uh, we are kind of unapologetically trying to find a particular design voice and design profile in the discourse. It's not, a new, it's not a neutral institution. It's not uh, like the idea that design is facilitation and essentially designer doesn't have ideas or, or, or a position, not simply an ethical position, but actually a professional position uh, based on you know, education and skills is something that I think uh, we are trying, we're not something that, that necessarily we, we subscribe to. Obviously, the, based on the kind of two main design directors uh, that, that uh, Stroka has had, uh, Rem, Rem Kulhas for, for the architects in the room, should be kind of a meme. Uh, and uh, obviously, um, the current director of the program, Benjamin Bratton, are, are not, uh, like have a very particular way into issues of architecture, urbanism, design, and media. And again, uh, as much of a, as a school of design, it is, it is also a school of thought. It is uh, the... the, the um, Sometimes uh, the, the line between theory and practice is obviously always blurred, but it is quite um, simultaneously nerdy, like hyper nerdy, hyper theoretical, and then kind of hyper down to earth uh, sort of practitioner side. Uh, that, that hybrid is actually interesting, uh, but again, it, it creates a kind of culture of design and outcomes of design that are not directly kind of Im immediately, intuitively, like, let's sit around the room with post-its and everyone's got to get them. Like they do require a kind of a, a learning curve, uh, which is not, uh, again, uh, we're not trying to replace all education with this. This is very much a postgraduate education kind of level. The researchers uh, who, I kind of use these words interchangeably. Like we don't have, we don't, we don't like to call them students. I just call them students because I'm, cause, cause I'm wrong. But uh, we call our students researchers and the researchers are, are Again, I kind of come from these two different uh, backgrounds at once. So in terms of our focus, uh, we have um, a range of different focuses. Uh, there's a kind of an interest in the city, in design research, and in Russia. Uh, when I mentioned the, the city, uh, of course, uh, being kind of uh, the DNA of the school being mainly from the architectural discipline, we focus on the city as an urban infrastructure, but not just that. It's also a technical, ecological, and social infrastructure. And um, this is why I mean that it's slightly uh, kind of a bit more uh, theoretical or, or, or complicated than it, that it needs to be. But I think this, this, there is this kind of popular mainstream conceptual stand sandwich somehow that somehow we have the ecology, uh, nature below us. Then we have, you know, you know, nature, something here below us. Then we have us on top with our cities, with our buildings, with our cars, and then on top you have sprinkled technology. Uh, like that conceptual sandwich is really inadequate. Uh, not only is it false, it's actually detrimental to how to think about the city, as I was mentioning in the beginning, uh, and also how to design cities. This artificial separation between sort of ecological infrastructure that allows us to kind of breed <laughs> urban infrastructure, which is the city that we kind of construct to create these kind of building-sized thermostats, 
and, and big data or, or, or AR. Like these things are actually all uh, components of urban design and, and uh, therefore before we can actually change how we think of cities and build cities, we need to update our conceptual models of what the city is. So this is something that essentially we, uh, we uh, think a lot about. So when uh, you think of Stroka as an urban design school and you see some of the outcomes, this is, this is why it's not, it doesn't look like master plans, but it looks like software design, uh, strategy, and protocols. So I'll, I'll, I'll obviously go into that uh, deeper earlier, later. The second kind of focus I think is uh, key is this focus on design research. Design research being obviously not just a descriptive uh, or prescriptive or, or analytical thing, but actually very much a propositional framework. So design research, um, even the term actually, it should be called designed research. Like the, the, what you choose to focus on, what you choose to kind of uh, bring in as, as, a, as a subject of design, that is very much a curatorial choice, an editorial choice, and therefore a design choice. So the, the, this kind of approach to design as editing, as opposed to design of creating self-expression, like creating new things out of your fantasy versus editing things on the ground uh, materially and conceptually is something that we kind of um, try to bring to the table. Uh, it's very much not a solutionist school. Like the solve for X uh, thing is really, um, it's, it's not necessarily, not that we're against solutions, but it's not the main focus to solve a problem. People who apply to Stroka don't, apply to solve climate change or, or solve the problem of social media. Uh, that's, they may work on these things, but essentially we're much more interested in kind of the development and the broadcasting and the refinement of critical variables rather than uh, you know, shining paths. Like here's a three-step process of how we're gonna finally figure out Facebook. It's much more about like trying to kind of find what are the actual variables deep down that are affordances for designers, that are uh, the starting points for design and therefore provoking and following the questions that we didn't know we were gonna ask. So uh, in that sense, uh, design is not uh, in this direction th towards the bright future, but actually it's about finding the, the kind of signs and, and, and uh, combining them in different, in different ways. And also why the focus of the city is important because this is the city, uh, what we, I mean, city, the, the built environment is where a lot of these critical variables lie and, and where these critical variables can actually uh, instigate and generate uh, possible positive uh, ways forward. Basically, the, the future of the world will be decided in how we design our cities, uh, definitely. And finally, uh, given the fact that this is uh, in Moscow, there is a focus on, but also a focus from uh, Russia. Uh, Russia is not necessarily the subject of the work, but it's definitely the lens and the entry point into some of these ideas. And uh, I think we're, it's quite, uh, I mean, it, it is nice that uh, Russia as a kind of a territory, there's such a benefit, uh, there's a benefit to the kind of geographical, uh, political and historical legacy specificity and scale. Like the, the, the wealth of ideas that kind of have uh, gone through and failed and some of it succeeded in Russia is really quite uh, interesting uh, and also the kind of precariousness of its political situation is also, I think, a generative, a generative uh, constraint uh, to think about some of the topics. And therefore, uh, I, I think there's this kind of a strange, uh, obviously, the cliche around the Russia is that it's a land of, uh, of paradoxes, which I think it is. But uh, more than that, I think there's a certain paradoxical freedom, freedom from the hype, freedom of the hype of like Berlin, London, New York, sort of like, here's what design is, here's what speckle design is. We're far enough to actually <laughs> not be in the center of all the kind of talking tours, but also uh, in a place that actually has a lot of the building blocks uh, for us to actually generate ideas uh, on our own, uh, which is really a nice position to be in, and I think also a, a, a huge um, gift uh, from, from, from the local context of Moscow. So uh, the, the terraforming is the kind of current program that, uh, that uh, we are running, uh, that we just kind of finished in this very strange uh, context uh, the first year. It's uh, sort of based on the kind of 
manifesto of, of, of Ben Bratton, who, who's the director. We just kind of completed our first uh, year with the first cohort, uh, being again a very multidisciplinary group of people, uh, architects, other disciplines, uh, Russia, CIS countries, and international. We've also produced our first batch of, of design research projects uh, that we kind of uh, showcased in the, in, the, um, in July. Uh, but actually, instead of talking about the, the, um, the, the current program, uh, and this is why also I was thanking the organizers earlier, I want to take a step back and think about the precursor to this particular program, which uh, maybe some of you have heard of, what was called the new normal. It was very much the kind of, um, the prototype possibly uh, of for, for the current program. And because it's actually complete, it allows to be um, an interesting case study for the kind of ideas that we're discussing this in theory, but learning from in practice what happened during these three years of the previous uh, kind of speculative urbanism think tank. It's also quite nice because we're just, uh, it allows us to kind of put some of the ideas together. So this program just concluded in 2019. Uh, before uh, you know, shit hit the fan. Uh, we had uh, 90 researchers go through it for the th for the 30 year for the three years. They were kind of assisted by, uh, as I said, around 120 kind of modular uh, visiting uh, faculty and experts, and we produced 22 projects. And again, uh, in a certain way, there's a nice dichotomy and kind of relationship between these two programs. If you're interested in knowing more about the terraforming, and you feel bad because I'm going to talk about a new normal. There is this kind of nice uh, relationship between the natural evolution in terms of the process of education and the kind of, I would say, technology of education, because actually these kind of patterns and, um, and uh, expertise is a type of technology that we kind of learned, adapted, and sort of tried to implement uh, the next cycle. But also there is a very sharp, I think, conceptual break from the type of project that we did with the new normal which, were, which was a speculative urbanism think tank, which was much more about thinking about unfamiliar topics to urbanism and bringing it in. Like, you know, it was 2017, right? So blockchains and, and different technologies, different uh, sort of trading algorithms, all sorts of things that we don't think of as urban design, we try to bring in. The terraforming is very much about the opposite. It's about familiar things in urban design such as uh, energy, such as uh, sustainability, such as um, sort of participatory planning, but looking at them in unfamiliar ways. So this is a little bit the relationship between both of these things. And this is why also I want to focus on the new normal as a, as a case study uh, for uh, design education and, and, uh, and creative learning. So I'll talk through briefly kind of the three, uh, three the things that, um, that um, retroactively I think uh, made the new normal what it was. There's definitely the story of the ambition, what we wanted to achieve, sort of who and why kind of thing. The, the work, what and so what. And obviously the experience of the people going through it, uh, which is the kind of uh, where and, and, and how, possibly. And uh, I think, yeah, this is, I was kind of over, overly optimistic that I was going to have time to talk about the, the terraforming. I probably won't. But if you have any questions about the new uh, design research think tank, uh, please uh, grab me at the end. I'll be happy to, um, to share. So the new normal, essentially, uh, why the, the ambition of this, of this project, uh, which started, I think, at a, at a nicer time, possibly at a, at, a, at a less strange time, 2015-16. Uh, I also mentioned uh, before coming to Strzok, uh, so I, I'm, I'm an architect, I used to work in, in North America in a quite, um, I think in a good corporate environment. I was working in a, one of those big, big uh, architectural uh, companies. And I joined in Strzok uh, in 2015-16 as a researcher, as a student during the 2015-16 program cycle, which, was, which used to be called the hybrid urbanism. Did the kind of uh, instinct that there was something to this digital thing that maybe we should be trying to kind of integrate in our practice uh, as architects. And one of the first things actually we wanted to kind of maybe let go of uh, in the new normal was this notion of the hybrid. The, the, the hybrid in itself uh, is something that we were talking about a lot uh, in the 2015-16 um, in cycle of hybrid urbanism, but it was really kind of clear to everyone that this, this concept of hybrid really is uh, useful to sort of name something when it exists and kind of it, it's a useful way into understanding something that is not yet named, 
but very quickly kind of becomes also detrimental uh, and therefore needs to be, something new needs to be uh, assessed on its own terms, basically. So cars used to be called horseless carriages, obviously, for, because of the horse, full horse carriage. Uh, but obviously now cars are something else entirely. And as they continue to change, obviously we don't call them, uh, we, don't, we don't call them horseless carriages anymore. And eventually we may not even be calling them cars anymore because another name for car could be, you know, CO2 emission, mobile CO2 emission box. Uh, and therefore, again, the, 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 thing that the, the point is that the, the term itself, the hybridity of it is useful for a while, but actually is not useful in the long term in order to understand what something truly is. Uh, another obvious example, the, the smartphone. Uh, yeah, smartphones are less phone than a bunch of other things. I mean, this is all kind of known to everyone, but essentially that it's essentially a, a great collection of military capacity technologies uh, combined in your pocket. Uh, it makes as much sense to call this a smartphone as it is to call it a smart calculator, a smart weather tracking device. Like what this thing actually is, is something that's pa passed way beyond the, the notion of the phone. Although again, the, the notion, the hybrid notion of smartphone is the way into actually understanding us and accepting us that, and for us to accept that object. And uh, unfortunately, the, the, the next in line is this notion of the smart city. I'm sure everyone's heard to death uh, about this concept. I certainly don't want to talk about it here. But there is a kind of uh, unfortunate uh, dichotomy that exists between, again, because the notion of the smart city is poorly named, like cities are already smart, like city plus technology means many other things, not just, and in fact, the city is already a technology. Uh, of, of, of governance and, and of, of, you know, the ability to have water in, in your home. So this notion of, like, the, 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 the fact that this concept is basically only encountered, and the fact that we think about cities only through this kind of either resisting the smart city, like resisting big tech, versus, yeah, go big tech, like, that dichotomy is really... Uh, Again, not, not only useless, but actually detrimental to, 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 the, to the concept. Uh, similarly, with, with climate change, uh, this fight between degrowth and acceleration, is, is the, the fact that these binaries are available to us, uh, it's probably m has more to do with like the, the culture war sort of uh, phenomenon than with the actual design thing at stake. And therefore, the necessity to move beyond the hybrid concept to actually understand what something truly is in order to, you know, understand but also change on the terms that it provides is something that's incredibly important and, and needs to be sort of uh, um, realized. So again, the, the, the point is that uh, all, of this, um, all of this kind of speaks to the poverty of the conceptual models that we actually do have available. We don't have the words, not only the words, we don't have the concepts to talk about the world as it has changed before our eyes as designers. And therefore, before having to uh, change something, we actually need to understand it first properly, not as a hybrid concept, but actually as uh, you know, new normal. So, yeah, a, a new conceptual vocabulary was is desperately was desperately needed, and arguably is still desperately needed in 2020. But it was, certainly was the case, and uh, in um, in early 2016, which again was a Happier, happier time, but before 2020 was the shit year. 2016, like, was the shit year, if you remember. Obviously, there was a whole range. This was as we were designing the program. This we would design the program basically. So the program ended in April. Uh, some of us were invited to kind of think through the next cycle, find a new director, and so on. And this happened basically right before, right after Brexit but before, essentially, the U.S. election. And we were kind of noticing this kind of political upheaval that, that, that was kind of storming uh, everything. And it was kind of also interesting to see people's, again, this sounds, feels like two lifetimes ago, but uh, the meltdown of Donald Trump, how he's not going to win, then the total meltdown, of, now he's clearly not going to win after the, the busting, and then a few weeks later, person of the year. So we were kind of experiencing this weird weird arc uh, from, from Moscow, no less. Uh, so you can imagine uh, how interesting it was for, for a foreigner uh, such as myself. Uh, 
There was also obviously like this this iconic photo, which I think is great still. Uh, the kind of the, the the beginning. Well, again, many smart people have been calling out big tech for years before like before 2016. But I think 2016 was really kind of the the, the landmark year for fake news and for for again this kind of the the new the, the new world order of all of us being plugged in. Uh, definitely something funny. And uh, again, this is culturally also we were we were we wanted to um, relate to this kind of new reality that uh, politically things were changing and, and culturally the association that people had with politics uh, were were changing uh, in like in this again amazing photo of Hillary Clinton supporters essentially not a single one of them looking at her, everyone looking at themselves with her through their phones like that is basically kind of. Again, not a 2016 phenomenon like influencer culture, but this definitely is was kind of part of the um, part of the shifts, kind of tectonic shifts that we wanted to kind of bring in into the program of the new normal to kind of uh, sort of look at these things. So basically, this kind of political, technological, and cultural things together, squeezing them in together, kind of created this what people were calling the strange hybrid. Like, oh, nothing makes sense anymore. Everything was a strange new hybrid. Our position is basically this is not a strange hybrid, this is the new normal, and therefore before we, we, we can shift it, we need to basically understand it as it is, not a hybrid, like things will slowly get to normal. Oh, like this is just like a black swan, uh, parentheses, uh, out of the ordinary kind of event. No, very much so um, our new thing, our, our new context. So the ambition for the program at that point was basically to understand this new context, essentially catch up to the present, uh, this is one of the cases, as is often the case, where theory lags behind the world. So we needed new theories, new ideas to explain the context in which we were in, propose new types of urban projects that would relate to this new normal reality, and uh, prototype uh, the relevant design practices that would be able to design those projects. So again, back to the original point, if we do seriously want multidisciplinary collaboration, it's not enough to relegate design as facilitation. It's actually, there is, it's kind of a strange assumption that unlike every other profession almost, design, like bottom-up design works. Like almost every other profession you would not think of it through this way. But somehow this instinct to put all design as design thinking and facilitation is something that I would personally strongly disagree with, but also in the, in, in the program, it was also not the position. So how can we understand the new reality? Use our collective interdisciplinary skill sets to propose relevant new normal design projects that don't look like buildings. And therefore, and how can we kickstart then if we, in the program, we put a lawyer, a sociologist, an architect, and a graphic designer to work together, how can this now be not a weird hybrid practice of like four people who basically compete for art grants, but become a new normal urban design practice. So that was, I think, the, the, the ambition. And again, the way that we were doing this was through this kind of design research framework that I was kind of explaining, uh, mapping the bizarre, bizarre ongoing circumstances once again, catching up to the normal. And uh, very importantly, again, not just analyzing, but proposing and enforcing new normative claims. That's why the, the word normal was actually quite useful. Normal as in like, here's the new normal, but here's the new normative. This should, these should be the new norms for designing, the, designing the, what comes next. The ability for design to not just um, observe and facilitate, but take a position and enforce a, cer a certain normative expertise. So that was more or less uh, the kind of, uh, conceptual pitch, let's say. Uh, obviously, Benjamin Bratton, the director of this, uh, has a much more in-depth uh, focus and kind of manifesto around this. Uh, what we wanted to do at Stralka was actually to try to think through designing uh, a new type of urban designer and strategist, and therefore providing something of a full-stack, quote-unquote, um, design education. So cherry-pick uh, faculty from different disciplines and try to or orchestrate them in different kind of modules to uh, teach various different skill sets uh, to, to designers. So obviously architecture and urbanism being the sort of the bread, you know, the, the kind of the, the bread of the meal, 
the, the, the foundation. Uh, although, again, as a side note, maybe we'll talk about uh, after whether it is the best starting point for this. Uh, but obviously, graphic design, filmmaking, spec design, strategic design, um, software design, uh, interaction design, uh, and importantly, also kind of uh, social sciences being having a role uh, and and legal. Actually, we we really try to actively um, sort of not poach because it's the wrong word, but uh, seduce that better kind of a better word. Seduce lawyers to take five months, six months off their practice to see themselves as designers because obviously the design of law is the type of obviously urban design that we all kind of all depend on but it's pretty rare for lawyers to think of themselves as designers again because we focus the flashy you know italian chair and not the systems in which we kind of all live in but that were products of design so the the goal behind this was to make sure that the architects can bring in these other skill sets from other disciplines into their kind of portfolio of skills, but equally, if not more importantly, for other disciplines, journalists, software developers, and lawyers, to think of themselves now as, as urban designers, because actually many of them are, except maybe with, without the proper education and mindset. Right, so we had this kind of, uh, over three years, we had these 30 people, these kind of three groups of, uh, of, uh, of practitioners. On the top, we had people from Russia, uh, and on the bottom, we had people from, from abroad. Each year, the, 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 the cohort was quite, uh, obviously, um, actually, I think I have, a slide, I have a slide here. So over the three years, we, have, we had 90 people, who, so three years of 30 people. Uh, over 30 countries were represented, and uh, of over 25 different backgrounds, professional backgrounds although sometimes it's quite hard to, to... And many of them actually had this problem. They were already doing new normal type of work, but there was just no way of calling it. So as a default, everyone was calling themselves like an artist or a researcher, uh, because that tends to be the default, right? That's how you can apply for, for, for funding uh, to do what you want to do. And we had a lot of people, both from the students, but also from the faculty uh, who came from these various different uh, backgrounds. And over the course of the three years, we produced uh, 22 uh, projects uh, that kind of now, as, as I mentioned earlier, we tried to kind of package into this, this kind of book. Uh, but also, each of them independently has its own kind of project website. And, and many of them actually have continued to work on these projects as a practice, which I think is quite nice to see. Plus one, the plus one being the new normal think tank itself. So this is something I just, sorry if I'm repeating myself, but very much not only the projects were the outcome of the program, but the design of the program as a template, as a prototype for design education in the 21st century, that is a design project that we undertook. So that's why the 22 plus one is really the outcomes of this, of this program. And that's why, again, the, the new normal, it's important to think of it as a meta project uh, that kind of unites all of them together. So, Briefly, what do I mean by full-stack full education project? Uh, but easiest way to explain this is basically to, to kind of break it down. Uh, so speculative urbanism, the front end, kind of the work, but really the think tank being the back end and being the experience, the experience of the researchers that, again, uh, probably more so than most design schools, was definitely uh, designed, uh, like designed is the good word, social engineered might be the, the bad word, but we definitely try to think about their experience as service designers. And basically, uh, again, not think of facilitation as in, let's facilitate a community. Here is actually, we are creating this community of people that come in as an anthropologist, a journalist, an architect. How do we make sure that we make their learning experience and uh, therefore their attitude to their own professions uh, as part of the design project as well? So. What, what do I mean by speculative urbanism? Obviously comes from uh, speculative design, right? Which is uh, kind of, has many words, but um, this is probably the most mainstream, the, the most uh, sort of biggest umbrella term that I could come up with. I don't think, again, I need to talk or expand on this concept. I'm sure everyone is familiar with the concept of speculative design uh, at this point, but essentially the shorthand is, the, it's an alternative to mainstream design culture that tries to make products, right? Different people have different definitions. Uh, usually it's talked about in the concept like asking questions or re-questioning -re our fundamental assumptions, right? Generating a conversation. Um, 
So last year I had um, one of my one of my, one of my friends uh, kind of reshare that tweet, which I thought was great, <laughs> which I also kind of agree with. It's 2025, and designers spend the last 20 years or so mainly using Stack Design to feed nostalgia about the same 15 people from the 70s, endlessly revisiting a range of kind of socially accepted, like you know, heads of the discipline. This is the one: transitioning from designing to fine art, <laughs> doing two-day workshops about the future. This, we've all been guilty of that, myself included participate in summer schools and provide corporate consulting. So long story short, there is some truth to the fact that, again, we need to be slightly more critical of that medium. And this is why one of the things that we wanted to kind of do at Strzelka and in the new normal and definitely in the terraforming was to kind of provide our own, uh, our own spin to it. And again, this, there's a whole other lecture that I could be doing on this only, but just for now, uh, to kind of give you the, a little bit of the context of how to read the, the upcoming work, um, when we talk about speculative, uh, we don't mean whimsical, constraint-free, uh, inspired by your dream last night, tabula rasa design. Very much on the contrary, it's about like almost like the, the hyper-functional and hyper-pragmatic to the point of being speculative. Like the, the layering of constraints that are so commonsensical and, and obvious and important in themselves, together, taking to the extreme, creates something that when you see it, it first of all looks bizarre, but, but more importantly, it also raises the question, how come the things that we think are normal, which are so different from this, which was designed because we took the important things to their logical extreme, why does that, why is this our normal? Like, why, why is speculative condos, people, like, why, why is housing as a bank account in, in London or in Dubai, normal, it basically has the, the effect of making the normal look absurd. So that's why we mean by specu speculative, in terms of speculative. Pragmatic to the point of being speculative. Not obvious versus impossible, not functional versus creative, but actually obvious yet impossible. It's obvious that we need to do this, but somehow it's impossible to do it right now. So what needs to change for us to actually be do, to do the thing that's actually clearly obvious, and therefore, why do we obviously do things that are impossible to be sustained in the long term? So that's a little bit our definition of the, of the term. And design, uh, design, again, we could talk about it at length, but um, kind of a personal definition is, uh, is I, I, I see it as, as an editorial practice. So it's, it's a composition that's articulated more possibly and probably always by removing in addition to addition. So saying this in a simpler way, thinking about design not as adding things to the world, new things that I've designed because I'm a designer, but really we are living in this kind of shared history, both cultural but again also material. The world is made of things that exist here and we are essentially editing it. Editing, which also implies re-editing. And also, again, the way that we thought about the projects and we continue to think about the work at Strelka is not finished, polished, definitive, artistic outcomes. Like, here's this beautiful thing, and then if you touch it, you ruin the concept. Which, again, somehow, sometimes design school and art school are being treated in this way. But thinking about them as kind of ongoing edits across the various media scapes. So the project, um, First of all, the projects live in various outcomes. The project is the idea, but the idea somehow it sometimes is shown as a film to some audiences. Somehow, sometimes it's shown as a, as a keynote to someone else. Sometimes it's a quick elevator pitch. Sometimes it's a trailer. The, the, the projects don't have one sort of shape, but exist as editorial cuts across medium, which also kind of implies that attention isn't being owed to you, but attention is kind of earned uh, which obviously kind of calls into mind, like, who needs to be seeing this? Sometimes it is the community. Sometimes it is the fossil industry. It kind of changes a little bit how we think strategically about the work that we, that we produce. So the point really is to take speculative design, hopefully a little bit outside of the kind of white space gallery, uh, be beyond the, the realm of symbolic 
representation or symbolic critique, like the, the symbolism around protest uh, is, is um, I think, ta tactically is showing its limitations, if you want to change the world for the better, uh, but also slightly further away from the kind of corporate consultancy model as well, uh, which again is not always, it's not that all, all speculative design consultancies are BS, but many of them actually are, uh, and sometimes are in, are in bad faith. Essentially, it's a kind of a placebo, placebo dance, placebo custom that, I'm speaking from personal experience, like sometimes if you work, you clearly see, you, neither you nor the client believe that this is actually going to change anything. And I think this is something that's very important to be stepping out of. Again, this kind of illusions of, of, of um, like possibly the only thing worse than not, you know, doing anything is pretending that you're doing something. And sometimes speculative design lives lives in that category. So that's something that we were trying to kind of avoid, like away from the kind of uh, posted corporate retreats. And uh, and. Uh, hopefully, uh, again, this was the ambition, not uh, always the outcome, closer to the seats of design itself. That's why I mentioned that it's not an art residency, it's not an incubator for, for like pitch deck for like the new dating app, but it's really about uh, the design of, of, of model, of better cognitive models, so better ideas of how to see the city, sometimes better digital models to actually be able to work with the data and even create the data that actually we need in cities. It's not really obvious why we need, well, it's for citizens, it's not really obvious why we need consumer habits data to make cities better. So what are the kind of data sets that we do need to be creating? Uh, and obviously, what are the policies that need to be put in place uh, to, to be able to act on this? So in that sense, we, we thought about urbanism uh, not as a genre of design, like here's what urban planning is, like it's a, picture of thing in plan, but a medium, a medium through which different design professionals could sort of enter through and do their own discipline. Like, if you're an interactive designer, how is your discipline sort of understood through the lens, through the medium of the, of the urban lens? Uh, hence, this focus on kind of urban infrastructure and typologies, uh, digital infrastructure and systems, and uh, social infrastructure and norms. You get the idea, kind of creates this, this, this space where, of course, you entered in as a professional, but once you're in, we didn't refer to the lawyer in a group as in, like, here's the lawyer. Like, we are now all new normal urban researchers. Uh, and that was kind of the, 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 the attempt to undo uh, some of the established silos of, of, of activity and, and expertise that uh, we kind of are, have inherited from, from, the, from the past. It was also an attempt to, to try to find the commonalities and, again, uh, not necessarily it, it, it's both about creating new silos of expertise, new fields, but also finding the bridges between existing kind of overlaps, uh, in, like in the case of uh, software programs and architectural program being obviously much more connected to, to, to one another, uh, model to model, uh, and obviously uh, increasingly software code being literally legal code. Like if the thing doesn't allow you to enter, like going through the... To be honest, the, the door was, was a bit faulty, but the, the, at the airport, the code of the software allows you to check your temperature, and that's what, that's what allows you legally to enter the thing. This is this kind of uh, overlap between software and policy that is really important, and obviously needs to be looked at not simply from the framework of resistance, like technology is bad and we need to, but actually how do we design, how do we design better, or how do we recognize bias in code, and how do we move past uh, the kind of problems that we have now onto the next problems? Again, it's not a solutionist uh, stance. So the projects uh, in themselves, uh, I don't have, I, probably also not uh, necessarily the most important thing in the context of this conversation, uh, but they took on various different forms uh, that we tried to sort of synthesize and summarize retroactively in, in, in the book. So, you know, under various different categories, uh, alt geographies, the design of alternative, geography, alternative geographies, alternative maps, deliberate deviations from how we actually tend to map cities. Obviously, the design of the map is the design of the legend. The legends that we design change how we see the city, and therefore how we see the city allows us to do things with it. 
So some of the projects were about the creation of alt geographies. Others had to do with this kind of speculative megastructures, which we called uh, essentially the design of alternative statecraft, the design of alternative political models, uh, like in the case of this project, uh, Sever, uh, which was looking at the problem of the Arctic, the problem of the melting of the Arctic, and uh, thinking of it as a problem of governance, essentially, since Russia says it's theirs, Canada says it's theirs, US and China says it's no one's, <laughs> uh, and I think the European, also, the European Union also has some claims. So they basically designed, um, they tried to design a new sovereignty, a new territorial alliance through the design of, um, of a cryptocurrency, of, of, a, of a coin that basically changed value based on the latitude of the of planet Earth. Like some, something that's worth one dollar at the equator is worth a thousand at the, this network of cities that are across the Arctic Circle. And therefore, by being united by this common strong currency, they would be able to basically uh, take responsibility, not the states, but the cities surrounding them being kind of this new um, megastructure uh, of polity. Synthetic cinema, uh, trying to foster new cinematic literacies. This also had to do with machine vision, understanding machine vision a bit better, uh, not as something against humans, but as something that's kind of, again, pattern recognition with specific set of affordances. Recursive simulation, the design of uh, software, the design of data sets, like probably one of the most important thing in a 21st century city will be to be designing the right data sets on which to train algorithms, right? Like data sets are design objects. So there's nothing neutral about them and uh, the fact that they're being designed in a very specific place and a very specific, in a very specific way have consequences. So local data ontologies. Uh, were kind of explored. Protocols and programs, this is where I talked a little bit earlier about the post-interesting, designing, looking at accountant, accounting mechanisms, looking at uh, insurance, you know, insurance being what we called the, the slow hand of design. When, it, when we think about, especially we're in Italy, when we think about like car design, like the, what has designed the car is less the kind of freehand sketch by whoever, but really the, all of the insurance claims and laws that have made the car into that type of object. So this kind of the force of insurance as a design medium into which to change how the city is, something that some of the projects looked at more strategically. The platform econometrics, the platforms we have versus the platforms we need, like maybe the platforms we have right now, Amazon, Facebook, Google, Airbnb, Facebook, and so on, are the ones we have, but maybe not the ones we need. So instead of rejecting all well, platforms are technology and technology is against humans, what, how do we take an active role into kind of changing the, the, or using the typology of the platform as an institutional model that's different from a state or a market, but really it's third own thing. It's not a hybrid term, it's its own term. And uh, taking an active hand into shaping it is important. And finally, um, kind of a idiosyncro idiosyncratic um, definition which we called uh, high ID, so human AI interaction design, uh, which had to do a little bit with uh, rethinking or thinking through uh, human to machine cognition and interaction. In other words, since we, like as, as, the, as, this, as, as this group, uh, which was called Tuda Suda, called, um, if you think about Tinder being uh, AI breeding humans, like humans meeting through the AI algorithm of Tinder has actually led to humans being born, even though no one really understands how Tinder actually works in the black box of their algorithm. Like what are other ways to kind of, this was basically their project for AI feeding humans, uh, which is, or growing humans more rather, because what we eat is how we, how we change. So this was basically a project between the conversation between an AI that was trying to optimize recipes or create with recipes in mind, and another AI who was uh, trying to be trained on the um, greenhouse, and how the conversation between both AIs changed the recipes that one was making versus changing the growing patterns uh, that the other one was making. Importantly as well, uh, as in, in many of our work, the speculative crazy st stuff here is not something that we came up with from scratch, but something that came in from research. Like there, there is already obviously AI-generated cookbooks, 
There's Chef Watson, if, if you know it, that's an AI that makes recipes. And similarly, a lot of the greenhouses that are really complex environmental systems are being managed by AI as, as we speak. This is not some sort of futuristic scenario. This is really us reading about the world that we live in and trying to kind of bring in those kind of parameters as, as design parameters. So all these projects basically form this kind of collective body of work, uh, engaging with, uh, with space, space with a Cyrillic C, uh, but also with uh, software, cinema, strategy, and protocols. The, the joke is getting old, but basically in the beginning, that's how we were trying to think about the, the program. Software, cinema, strategy, protocols, CCCR, and obviously these being not genres, like here's the strategic projects, here's the summer projects, but really these are all ingredients that we kind of bring into the mix. And each project had to kind of think about uh, how one affects the, the other in, in the context of their project. The point, uh, of course, being the strategic orientation of literacies. Like people who are, um, people had to learn to read and understand the projects on their own term. Projects that weren't made for an audience that already existed, but projects that try to design their own audience. Like, how do we get people around the table from law, from ecology, from art? They become this new audience that the projects conjured. So the projects, the design of the projects was really the design of the audience for the projects, which is really also, uh, as, as a meta comment, how we were thinking about the new normal. It's not just the design of the projects. It's not even just the design of the program as a project, but really it's the design of the field. Like we want to more schools to be like this. We are trying to create a, a field of competition and, a, and collaboration really, as opposed to designing the thing in itself. So that requires the conjuring of an audience. And finally to conclude, uh, <laughs> I see the not last but not least truly, is the, the kind of experience, the kind of uh, human, uh, component of this project. Uh, we were thinking about these projects, uh, again, see they're all alone, but really the, we were, when we were starting the program, we were really thinking about them in the same context as the, um, as the Star Wars franchise, or really as the, as the Marvel shared universe. Like all of them are standalone films, but really all of them are, the project is the shared universe. Like each film from this franchise as in each lunchbox, each Lego set, each video game, each t-shirt are sure great standalone things that exist in their own way, that have their own purpose, that have their own audience, but all them together reinforce one another into the kind of the design of the shared universe, which is why uh, Marvel and Disney are so uh, incredibly, um, incredibly rich. <clears throat> So same thing with the new normal. Really, the new normal was supposed to, was thought through as a shared uh, as a shared universe uh, by design from the beginning, and that's why again the design of the think tank being the meta project was was really key. Uh, the design of the structure, social contract, and archive were really key components of this of, the, of this work. And again, I'm probably uh, slightly soon out of time, but I'm really trying to kind of bring this home that. Uh, this is really not a way to replace wholesale design education, but it is a prototype of design education that we try to design as a design project. So typically, our education cycle at Straka uh, uh, runs uh, into the production and broadcasting phase. We spend the first uh, five months uh, in, with the researchers that come to Moscow, uh, including field trips, and then we kind of work, kind of close ourselves in the world, uh, try to, um, yeah, try to sort of establish a kind of a culture and, 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 and a, a way of thinking about these things collectively during the production phase. And there's a huge kind of, if some of you have been to, to Moscow during that time, a huge broadcasting phase where the sort of residency ends. Uh, students no longer uh, get the stipend. Some of them leave, some of them refuse to leave because they, they including myself for so many years. <laughs> Uh, but really the broadcasting phase is one where we sort of open up the, the doors and try to present the work in as many uh, places as possible. Both of these are design projects, essentially trying to share and make public the research uh, that we produced is really a key component, uh, such as uh, this, uh, this setting as well. In a way, uh, we think of the projects not as the last student presentation, 
but really as the first public presentation of an idea that will hopefully uh, continue to grow and continue to be, again, an edit across very various uh, media scapes. So again, before the new normal, we had one year, one program. Hybrid urbanism, my, 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 my cycle was 20, uh, 20 um, so October 15, April 16. We decided to change that, to sort of not look at a cumulative, sort of a self-contained topic. And the cohort is one cohort of 30 sort of alumni graduates who are all friends. But really try to think about it in a cyclical way where it, it is always a different group of 30 people. But obviously the first year cares about the second year because they're continuing to work on the same topics. They present their projects. Some, some of them come to lead workshops. Some of them come to give guest lectures. It's really about the, crea the, the creation of a network of people across three years uh, that kind of obviously try to, to, um, yeah, to, to, to create a, a community. So this is kind of a timeline of Stroke alumni over the years. Uh, each year is really, uh, the experience of being at Stroke is quite um, in, uh, intense, uh, being, being a, a former graduate as well. So you kind of stay very good friends with the people that you were part of this painful experience with. But really what uh, we tried to do by design is to make sure that these three years really all felt like one, like one group, to kind of sh grow the, the, the people but also learn from one another. And, uh, and uh, it's not uncommon since the final projects have a, have a budget. Like we, we give the, each final group I'll talk about it in a bit, but we give the final group a budget to produce the final project. And um, yeah, very often they can, they can hire people to work on these projects. Obviously they need someone who is an editor or a film or a sort of more technical person. And it's quite common that the students in the previous years want to be sort of hired or, or become a resource, sometimes hired, sometimes for free helping out with the more technical bits to make sure that the projects kind of, uh, kind of um, are presented. Uh, because again, as the shared Marvel Universe, like the success of one project lifts all the other ones. They're, each project is an entry point into the project itself. So that's really, uh, really important. And again, creating the right culture, the right think tank culture and social contract allows people to think of themselves not as, as it is often the case, uh, in my opinion, in American universities and sometimes uh, kind of the fancier UK and uh, European universities, because it is so expensive to come to go to school, you see yourself as a client. Like I am buying my way into this, so it's all about me. Like if I'm not going to spend 40 grand a year, if like you, you, the, your whole attention is not being focused on me, because this is free and not only free, it's getting paid, that changes the mentality around education. You don't see yourself as a client who deserves stuff because our program is far from perfect. We, we, it's pretty real time, we fuck up all the time. So people are much more comp like lenient with us as, as the kind of the, 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 the sort of direction team and among each other because they kind of understand the, 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 their position to the think tank being one of collabor collaborators versus clients. So hence this kind of cord of, of 30 people. And again, as I mentioned, each, each year is very, very short, only five months. The final projects that we have are all done in five weeks. Again, the intensity is on purpose. It's less about doing three years of research and then being really careful about what you present, but really kind of diving in and kind of testing out something. Uh, but because it's kind of three years cycle, the, the outcome is much, uh, much stronger. And again, it creates a, a relationship of, comp of collaboration because there are no grades, because there are no exams, you don't compare yourself with like who's the best student, who's the worst student. Usually, the the kind of um, the, the kind of uh, culture there is that um, there's always like in every week in the beginning, especially where we have like two or three modules and workshops a week. There's always like if we're doing something on architecture, the architects are like now the smartest people in the room. They feel very confident. Everyone else feels like insecure because clearly they don't know who Ram Kulhas is, nor should they. But then the, the following week when we have something on, let's say, scripting or processing, all of a sudden the architects become very humble because, oh shit, now they don't know anything. And that also kind of creates this, 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 this hopefully, and again, I'm not saying it's, it's working 100% of the time, that's the point. You get to see the kind of conflicts that arise. You get to see the challenges of prototyping multidisciplinary education, not as a kind of a, as a, as a wishful thinking label, advertising label, like our, our school is collaborative, because every school says that, but actually uh, 
trying to see what works and what doesn't. And again, because we have about six or seven, sorry, seven to nine final projects a semester, I would actually say that uh, at least two or three of them don't work out. Like not 100% of the work that we do is very good. This is also something that's important. I'm sorry if some of the students uh, heard me online. Um, it also kind of allows the network, like the faculty, to also see themselves as researchers. So again, because uh, some of them are obviously full-time academics, but other of them are not academics, they don't teach uh, full-time for a living, it kind of allows them to sort of see themselves as, I also have some new material, I'm not really sure where this is going, but because it's a, it's a think tank culture, they're coming in and the way that we kind of sell it to them, uh, because it is a long way to fly to Moscow, is like, um, look, you, we looked at 400, 300 people, we picked 30 really, really interesting, strange characters. Like, this is an opportunity for you to kind of sort of test out your thing uh, and sort of get, just think collectively on the things that you are essentially want to think about. And that is usually much more of an incentive uh, because, again, the, the, the budget is quite uh, limited or more limited than some of the more Ivy League uh, schools that we have. So we have various, uh, various experts from around the world, uh, so full-time faculty, people who kind of come for a module basis. So people either come for you know, a three-day thing, they, sometimes they join us on a field trip because we have two field trips every year. Uh, sometimes they, they come in for a guest lecture. Uh, sometimes they come in at the final presentation, at the first public presentations uh, where uh, they sort of become sort of not jury necessarily because it's not like judging what you did wrong, but trying to kind of plug in, oh, this is really great. There's this upcoming conference um, um, that I'm curating. You should come and present there. So again, trying to kind of foster a network and obviously try to take full advantage of the fact that we are in Russia and uh, trying to sort of bring in voices, uh, bring in voices that, um, again, many of the, they're not sort of like celebrity uh, professors, but that, that usually makes them actually much more interesting. And again, collectively working on this uh, cumulative research themes. So first year, second year, third year. The, in the first year, we had the five original themes. Each year, we don't abandon necessarily some of the stuff we did before, but we kind of add to it. We realize that we actually talked a lot, a lot about something here that's neither this or this, so it's a new theme. So again, this kind of cumulative structure uh, is, is something that this kind of in, sort of design allows us to, to have. Which leads me to kind of the, the last point uh, uh, being the educational platform and the archive of this. So I mentioned earlier that the design of the data set is a data project. Uh, similarly, I think all institutions should think of themselves as a kind of a digital depository of, of, of content that is, especially at this critical time, could be useful outside of their own. And uh, we try to use uh, as much as possible, um, I guess you've already kind of figured out that we're not necessarily a, pro a program that opposes technology. Neither are we one that embraces technology, but essentially if the city is technology, then and if language is technology as, as it is, like it, it's not about resisting or, 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 um, or, or embracing, but trying to kind of take advantage of the tools that exist and also create, see them also as open-ended, you know, uh, design projects in themselves. So, the parallel that I could make is uh, before uh, joining uh, Straka, as a, as a student, I, I was an architect uh, at, this, at this firm, and I worked for about um, six years on a single building, which says a lot about the, about the architectural discipline compared to some of the other more fun design things. But uh, I was working on this competition for the largest hospital in, uh, in, in Can Canada, but I, I, maybe North America, actually, I, I forget. But this huge, this huge building, like 22, 22 floors above, uh, seven parking levels, like th this incredible complicated design task, uh, infrastructural design task, which I think was an in incredible experience, but also very formative as an education experience. And it became very clear very quickly that the design of the hospital for us architects and for every, all the other consultants in the room who were working on us, you know, lighting, engineers, and so on, we were designing the model, because none of us was building the building, we were actually tending to this kind of virtual simulation model of the thing that was actually gonna get built that is actually still in construction in Montreal right now, even though uh, we submitted the plans in like 2013 or something. So it's still being built. 
And basically, this kind of relationship between the model and the building, the model as a depository of, of, of knowledge and intent, like our decisions being baked into the model from which we could print plans so the people who are building it are actually making it, this relationship was really interesting uh, for, for me, for me as, as an architect, but also contractually, actually. You know, we, we were delivering not just the building to the city, but we were delivering the model, because this is where we, we can sort of, if something breaks, you sort of see, um, is it because we didn't plan it according, properly, or is it because the people didn't build it? Like, the, the model itself increasingly becomes, um, becomes an entity in itself that has this kind of relationship with the building. Uh, and we were thinking about, the, or when, when I came in, I was thinking about it in the same way about the education process itself. Like, there is a very, very important relationship and codependency co between the digital archive that we were and the digital tools that we were kind of um, tinkering with and adapting uh, and the process. And obviously one and the other were not independent. By having a, a more up-to-date archive of the process and the content, we were having a better program. So again, it's not about big data being bad, it's about the right data being designed. Uh, uh, and Actually, this is kind of a side note, but uh, data should really be, like data in Latin, I think, means given, whereas it's, I think the right word would be capta. Capta me means made, like data is always made. So what kind of data, what kind of capta should we make to ensure that what we are tracking ends up having the beneficial impact back into the real? So the model and the real having this relationship. So across the, the, the program, we were keeping track both of the content like every, every project is archived, uh, keywords, media content, and so on. Uh, and all the collaborations were also being tracked in real time because we have 30 people. Uh, I think I, me I maybe I didn't mention it, but like 100% of the work is collaborative. Like each week we have two or three workshops. Each workshop is a different team. Most of the time we make the team. So we, ch we keep changing the teams over, making sure that people get a chance to work with everyone else before the end of the program, but also on uh, taking a look like what kind of collaborations are productive so that when we do make the final projects, which is also we make the final teams for the final projects, uh, we want to make sure that we put people who will, again, collaborate, but not do the lowest common denominator work. So sometimes the process is difficult, but the, the work would be, would be good. So we were sort of uh, taking... Uh, this uh, quite seriously, I think, uh, trying to keep track of weeks, workshops, field trips, lectures, faculty, guest lectures, and so on. So each week essentially had uh, the associated uh, projects that were built during that week, plus the faculty that was kind of present. Each uh, researcher, if you can see here, people that they've already worked with are highlighted. On that week, they worked together on this project, which also allowed us quite easily to see who hasn't worked with who yet. So the next week, we can make sure that we put them with someone else. And again, that allows us to make this really complicated 30 people having to work with 29 other people process uh, more manageable because it, 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 it wasn't uh, algorithmic, obviously. Uh, the faculty that come in and kind of lead workshops, uh, the projects that they were associated with. So each one of the, the, the red dots was a project. Each project obviously is kind of archived uh, as an idea. Uh, this kind of creates two things. It creates basically, on the one hand, uh, like I already mentioned, um, this kind of divestment from your, you know, holding the project as like uh, a representation of you, so which sometimes in school becomes very toxic. Like if my project fails, I am a failure. The projects were very, very quick, forced you to kind of sweat them out. It's okay to do a bad project once in a while. The idea wasn't there, fuck it, I'm sorry. Uh, but, and um, the other thing that it created is basically to, to eliminate the sense of authorship, which I think is really, really important in design school. Uh, the, the fact that these different studies were all conducted and presented weekly, you kind of, even yourself, two weeks in, you don't remember who did spongization. Like, you really don't. Of course, I can see in, my ar in, in the archive who made it, but in, in the group, as we were discussing ideas together, no one remembers that this is, you know, Denise's project. This is a project from the think tank. 
it becomes a, a collective body of work that during the final projects we can all pull in. So we had cases, for example, in the past where some of the final projects which had to do with food borrowed heavily on research that was done earlier in the five-month process because, again, everything is kept, but none of the people in the final group did any of that research. They simply used it because it's collectively owned and collectively sort of assembled. And again, the, the sense of like, this is my idea, this is your idea, that toxicity uh, in competition, that was a way to alleviate that through the, through the archiving, which is also made available, of course, to the, to the whole group. Yeah, again, some of the, uh, these sort of 150 to 180 collective studies in the first four months are really what informed the last seven or eight projects uh, at the end. And as I mentioned again, this, this, this notion of the ongoing collaborations to basically be able to, 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 keep, to keep track uh, of, of this. Uh, I, I wouldn't say that this is uh, surveillance, uh, which also shows uh, how poor our, our conceptual models are when dealing with data and people. We're not surveilling the students. We're simply trying to keep a record of who has worked and with who so that we can actually make sure that they work with different people in the next project, but also work in, in, in collaborations that, that uh, are fruitful for them, uh, because obviously this is all very, very much based on feedback. We have weekly archiving process, and each archive form has uh, individual and collective feedback. So again, we learn from the faculty, we learn from our own kind of, let's say, facilitation and running thing, and we also learn about personally their experience working with so-and-so to make sure that the personalities match which is also what leads to this kind of multidisciplinary teams at the end, usually uh, always at least an architect, always at least uh, a Russian or a Russian-speaking person in the team. But again, uh, all of them are formed uh, based on, on, I would say hours, based on my, myself and, and, and the tutor's sort of uh, observations from the past kind of uh, four months. And again, some teams work out great, still friends working together either on this or something else. Some people uh, don't speak much anymore, but that is also reality. This is what I mean, like this is also, like the, the notion that you have to sit in a chair and collaborate magically with everyone all the time uh, is I think uh, not, a, not, a, not, a productive, uh, not a productive idea. Uh, I guess the, the, the point here, which is my, my, my final point, is that, again, less, it's less about the projects, but more about the new normal design practices that we're trying to initiate both the people working together, learning to work together, but also us trying to create a field, uh, a field of practice uh, that, uh, that, um, that can sustain and hopefully lead as a case study, as a case study of, that works for some things, doesn't work for others, for other schools to take on this initiative of having free plus stipend, short burst education experiments, like the one that we uh, are conducting at, uh, at Stroco. And basically, the, the book kind of tells everything that I talked about now. Ambition, work experience is more or less how we made the book. We basically wrote three books, kind of sandwiched them together, and that created the final, the final book. Uh, as predicted, I won't have time to talk about the next program, but if you have any questions about what stayed and what we threw away, uh, please uh, grab me. Uh, it's also available, obviously, online, the terraforming. We're currently accepting applications for the second cycle of this three-year program. Um, and, uh, yeah, please uh, grab me if you have any other comments, thoughts, or, or concerns. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nikolai. Um, I have, um, we, we will have a short break after um, Nikolai's um, yeah. final Q&A. Yeah. Sorry, <laughs> sorry about the, the, the long and, and, and speedy rate of, of, of talking. No, no worries. Um, just, uh, yeah, it's just to uh, ask everyone to wait a second and then we will have a 10-15 minutes break. Um, I have a quick question. Um, today when a young designer applies to the work, it's Probably not in your case, like not in case of your program, but um, overall when we talk about design education, we see um, 
um, that after the graduation, a young designer, when he comes to a work, working environment, um, it's always requested to be able to um, be proficient in various programs and to be at the same time open-minded and to have skills in UX uh, design and uh, great oratory skills and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and at the same time, we talk about the necessity for a designer to be interdisciplinary and uh, to be uh, to develop different skills. So my question is, uh, what are actually the skills that a designer shouldn't have? Sh shouldn't have. Should not have. Should not have. Uh, that's a good question. It's, it's uh, not, uh, I haven't thought about that uh, fully, so my answer might be a bit uh, improvised. Um, I think one of the most important uh, things for a designer is also, uh, and I think I mentioned this uh, implicitly and explicitly many times, is this kind of uh, attachment and obsession with the work that they make uh, is something that I think is really a tainting um, design c culture. I think even, even art school should have less of that, but definitely in design school, the notion that you are the work and the work has to be 100, good 100% 100 of the time uh, is, is one which is really toxic. So uh, a, design, a skill a designer should not have is this, I think, unhealthy emotional attachment, uh, which sometimes is called passion. And passion is important, but, but uh, also uh, it's not to say that every single thing you do, it has to, a, save the world, B, uh, prove yourself. So maybe ego is something that uh, some designers should have less of. Thank you. Um, very interesting answer. Would be nice to hear also others because um, answering the same question. Um, and there is another question uh, about the current urban design situation in Russian cities. So, um, what is the biggest problem that you've faced so far working especially with students in the territorial, um, with the territorial analysis of what is the current situation? So what was the, the most problematic? The, the current situation in uh, urban planning in Russia? You mean the challenges of that? Yes, you can, I think you can interpret the, the urban in, not especially in planning, but also like the, the urban ecolo ecology, so the urban ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, I think there's a whole, I'm not the most qualified person to speak about this, but there's a whole uh, range of research and thinking around the problems with these kind of post-Soviet, uh, you know, uh, whether it's uh, the micro rayons or whether it's these kind of closed cities that are not, uh, Russia is very obviously very centralized in terms of like, there's Moscow and then there's like the first ring of Moscow. So every, like the farther you're away from that center, which is the Kremlin, in terms of uh, urban infrastructure, the more uh, the more impoverished often it is. But uh, I, I think so. The problems with this are are um, are clear, and they require essentially people having um, an, an attachment with their city at the level that some of the European capitals have it. Like people in Amsterdam and in Copenhagen, where I've studied, like they really see the city as theirs, and the kind of they 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 want nice cities because they can see what nice cities give. Uh, that culture is not always present everywhere in Russia. But in, in the other hand, I think also that the, the benefit is that for a lot of these um, cities, and even I think in Russian, so I think you're Russian and I'm, I'm not Russian, but uh, the word for public space is not one which is very kind of, that has the same connotations. I actually don't even know how to say it in Russian myself. So it's basically an opportunity to design that culture, to design that expectation that the city and public spaces in the city should be present. So what I've seen working around Russia is that people are actually super enthusiastic and, and have the opportunity because they don't have to unbuild as much. Like they don't have to take down all the highways like they are doing in the US because actually they just haven't been built. So that's, 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 a, that's a benefit. Um, also following the, the question that I've asked previously, um, Ella, about the multiculturality and teaching in um, in the multicultural um, environment. Do you face a challenge of um, this type in Russia, while teaching in Russia? Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's a challenge everywhere. Uh, in, in Russia, I mean, obviously, we have half of the cohort being international. And sometimes you do see the kind of differences in, in, um, in thinking around design, and even thinking about education in general. Because in some cultures, for example, like the West, we always have a few kind of uh, Ivy League kind of graduates 
who are used to kind of expressing themselves, good communicators, uh, having an opinion about everything, which is good. But sometimes in the Russian schools, you see that the culture is different because the master is the, the professor is the master, and everyone else tries to get a good grade, like in the, like in Bulgaria, where, where I'm from. Uh, so that's one of the like adapting to these cultural um, um, inertias, like West versus East, is, is challenging with a program like ours. Uh, another, uh, I think, to, to Ella's point earlier, which I agree completely, uh, her work being in the Global South, it, sometimes it's true that we actually have no business going elsewhere. Like, I basically, I, I would think that some of these design facilitation programs are, even though they are happening in the Global South, they are very much a Global North necessity uh, and uh, somehow justify their, their, the, it's essentially a different form of, of, uh, of cultural occupation that uh, sometimes does not need to happen. I, I don't know if the, our program is, does that because our program is not necessarily focused on activating the local community. Uh, the, the local community is quite strong in Moscow. It's a very vibrant cultural place. Uh, so what we're doing is basically we are in a bubble in Moscow. Uh, and I, I mentioned the benefits of being in Moscow. Like we're not in London, we're not in Berlin where every Thursday there's like someone famous speaking and it's, we're constantly being distracted. That's a benefit. Uh, multiculturally, in, in, in Russia, our program is, is not, doesn't have the same problems as the Global South uh, example, I think. Thank you. Um, thank you, Nikolai. Thanks. And thank you. Thank you all.